nearly 250 years ago gave birth to a special place called America. It was a small cluster of colonies caught between a great ocean and a vast wilderness. It was home to an incredible people with a revolutionary idea that they could rule themselves, that they could chart their own destiny, and that together they could light up the entire world. Hello, friends. Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to our program, Praying for America, which we bring you in conjunction with Right Side Broadcasting Network and our Priests for Life team as well. Great to have you with us. I want to talk tonight a little bit about prayer and give you some prayer resources, particularly the election prayer. Now, as we're getting deeper into the midterm elections, we need to be praying the election prayer. If you've watched me over the years, you're familiar with this prayer, but I want to reintroduce it and get us into the habit of saying it daily as we uh, get closer and closer to uh, election day and many more primaries that are happening throughout the country. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk to you about some other prayer resources as well. We're all people of prayer, people of faith, and uh, we are, of course, praying for America. So we need to talk a little bit about the nature of prayer and the resources available. So let's go to the scriptures first. I want to pray uh, the um, words here in uh, Philippians 4, starting with verse 4, a very familiar passage. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. The Lord is near. Dismiss all anxiety from your minds. In everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then the God of peace will be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you be with us and be with the United States of America at this point in time. Be with those in government office. Lord, teach them how to build up this country rather than tear it down. Teach them how to enhance freedom rather than inhibit it. Teach them how to secure our borders rather than destroy them. Teach them how to protect the unborn rather than kill them. Teach them, Lord, how to increase our economy rather than increase our prices. Teach, Lord God, those that you have chosen for public office how to carry out the duties of public office with the humility that your word requires. Teach all of us how to rejoice in you at all times, which does not, O oh God, mean ignoring the problems that are around us, but rather opening our eyes to the bigger reality of your presence and your grace and your victory over falsehood, sin, and death. Dismiss all anxiety, Lord, from our minds and from our lives. Let us live with the peace that you, the God of peace, bring to us. We ask all this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Well, first of all, I want to respond to this lunacy of some on the left and the Democrat mob actually taking the phrase, the party of death, and trying to apply it to the Republican Party. Now, these people need to get down on their knees and repent because, you know, the deepest, darkest blindness is when we have a sin and we completely deny that we have a sin. We say that we're doing what is right. And then we accuse the other person of the sin. Now, obviously, there are many that are trying to politically exploit 
the killings that have taken place in various places at various times, most recently with in Uvalde, Texas. We continue to commend to the Lord uh, those that have died and the families who are grieving. We, uh, we pray for them every day. I'm sure you do uh, as well. And we have to do everything possible to uh, unite uh, as a nation and uh, do everything possible to prevent things from happening like this, protecting our children. And there's a lot that can be done. And all, all public officials from all parties have to look with an open mind to see what it is that can and should be done. But what we can say for sure is that guns do not commit sins any more than knives or bombs or cars do. It's not the instrument of violence that is guilty. It's the person who uses it. So obviously, uh, when people talk about gun control, need to be talking first about self-control, maybe about instilling some virtue in our society. That, of course, is the constant mission of the church. And uh, laws have a role to play in all of that as well. Furthermore, some people are, in talking about gun violence and gun control, are putting forth the most ridiculous ideas that somehow, somehow, depriving good people of guns or making laws that will, 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 will tighten security in various ways is somehow going to have any effect on evil people who are going to do mass shootings. You think they care about gun control laws? You think they're not going to be able to get a gun or a knife or a bomb or a car or, or, or whatever it is that they want to use and kill people? I mean, what kind of craziness is this? So all of this we know, I'm sure you've been involved in many discussions as have I and, and so many commentators are doing an excellent job sorting all this out. And of course, the commentators on the left are just spewing their, their ridiculous, idiotic lunacy uh, like they always do. What else is new about that? But I do want to address one particular sliver here of what's going on. The audacity of the party of death, which is the Democrats, calling the Republican Party the party of death. Why? Because they don't agree with their, with their advocacy of the Second Amendment? That's not an advocacy of death. That's not an advocacy of violence. That's not the slightest bit of a toleration of violence, first of all. But that's not even the main point that I want to make. The main point that I want to make is the guilt that the Democrats have for the real death by abortion that is happening in our country, not theoretical, not maybe there's a causality between this and that and the other thing, but an actual tearing apart of children, limb from limb, not on some kind of a of a of a of a whim or on by 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 some sort somebody losing their mind or or running off and doing evil, but by a planned advertised, scheduled, quote-unquote, legal, legal activity. What, what, what was, is, is killing, is walking into a school and killing children legal anywhere in this country? Would anybody ever dare to even imagine that such a thing would be legal? And yet, there is legal, legal, child killing happening every day in America, sponsored by, advocated by, paid for by, justified by the Democrats. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. This is a four-frame image of a legal procedure that tears a child in the womb apart by abortion. Forceps go into the womb, grab a piece of the child, an arm, a leg, a foot, and literally rip it off and take it out. That's abortion. The leg comes out. The baby begins to bleed. The baby is still alive here, by the way. These procedures take place in the second trimester of pregnancy. And then with the legs and arms removed, the, the torso piece by piece, is pulled out. You can read this in medical textbooks. I'm not making this up. And then the skull is removed in fragments 
collapses and is pulled out. Now, anybody want to deny that this is, is death and that this is violence? Anybody want to deny that this is legal? This is legal activity in America, abortion. And anybody want to deny that the Democrat Party are the ones promoting this, calling it in their platform a right, no, wanting no restrictions on it whatsoever, recently voting in Congress on full display in front of the whole country, that they want this kind of activity not to have any restrictions, limits, or God forbid that somebody's right to do this would be taken away. People on the left, pro-abortion fanatics of the Democrat Party, don't you dare use the phrase party of death for anybody. You get down on your knees, you turn your face to God, and you ask forgiveness. First of all, for literally supporting and promoting this, what I just showed you. And secondly, for daring to try to project onto anybody else uh, the, the, the advocacy of death. You, brothers and sisters, like President Trump always says, the people who are doing this, they're, they're sick. These people are sick. Okay, I want to turn here to uh, a remedy for all that, and that is prayer. Now, we heard Paul writing to the Philippians talking about prayer, and he says, do it with thanksgiving and do it with peace of mind and make your supplications to God. And this reminds us, and I just want to give some quick examples here, and I'm going to show you some prayer resources, and we're going to look at the election prayer, that prayer has different dimensions. There's different types, different categories. We see this in the scriptures, different categories of prayer. So, for example, if you go to Revelation 5, okay, you have the, 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 the prayer of praise being raised in the heavenly Jerusalem, God is seated on the throne and the lamb who was slain. And the prayer rises up. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and praise. What kind of a prayer is that? Notice the prayer is not asking for anything. The prayer is one of adoration. We are looking at God and we are adoring and glorifying him. It's the same in... Uh, in the book of the prophet Isaiah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of his glory. This is adoration. We're looking at God and singing his praises. That's the focus of the prayer. So that's one kind of prayer. And of course, it should fill our lives. And it is, um, it is there in the uh, scriptures at various key points. Then we have prayer of contrition, asking forgiveness for our sins. Psalm 51 is an example. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness, in your greatness of your compassion. Blot out my offense. Thoroughly wash me of my sin and of my guilt. Cleanse me. So this is a psalm, a prayer of contrition. We ask forgiveness for our sins. And of course, there are multiple examples elsewhere in Scripture, and it should be a daily type of prayer in our lives. Then, of course, there's thanksgiving. We thank the Lord for his bountiful love. We thank him, and Paul refers to this right here in, uh, in Philippians 4, the passage that we read, present your prayers with thanksgiving to God. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Thank you for all your benefits. Thank you for what you have done. I give you thanks, O Lord, many of the Psalms. I give you thanks for rescuing me, for delivering me. Look at the thanksgiving that the Israelites gave to God in uh, Exodus 15 once they had crossed the sea. So it was a combination, actually, of thanksgiving and, and adoration. They crossed uh, the sea, having beheld the mighty hand of God drowning Pharaoh and his forces in the Red Sea, and they gave thanks to God. And then there's supplication, and it should come last in the sense that we, we give honor 
to God where honor is due before we ask something for ourselves. And we ask forgiveness for our sins. We acknowledge that we are not worthy, again, before we ask something for ourselves. But then we go ahead and ask because the Lord wants us to ask. And this is the prayer of supplication. You think, for example, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 3 of Solomon. Remember the Lord, the Lord said to him, ask me what you want. And Solomon said, give me wisdom. These kinds of prayers are so pleasing to God because when we ask him for something, we're acknowledging, first of all, that he is the source of everything that's good. We're acknowledging that we depend on him. And then it is particularly pleasing to him when we ask for something that then is going to glorify him, something by which we're going to be able to serve him and our neighbors. And wisdom is such a a tremendous a gift and tool to do exactly that. So there are various dimensions of prayer, various types of prayer, and uh, the scripture illustrates all of them, as does Christian history down throughout the centuries. I want to share with you a particular prayer that we have said before on this program, and I want to reintroduce it uh, to our audience, especially if you have recently started watching us. And let me give you a special website, and this will be the action item I recommend for uh, tonight's show. Go to this website, download the prayer. You can even get it on a nice prayer card like this. It's an election prayer, and that's the website, electionprayer.com. It's there in English and Spanish. You can let us know that you're joining in, in saying it. It's a prayer campaign throughout the nation. And I want to say the prayer now and ask you to join me in your mind and heart. But then I want to explain more about the different portions of the prayer. And then I'll share with you a few other prayer resources. Uh, you'll want to uh, hang on till the end here tonight because I want to share you some, share with you some little prayer booklets that you can get. Uh, but, but electionprayer.com, here's the prayer. Let's pray it together. Oh God, we acknowledge you today as Lord not only of individuals, but of nations and governments. We thank you for the privilege of being able to organize ourselves politically and of knowing that political loyalty does not have to mean disloyalty to you. We thank you for your law, which our founding fathers acknowledged and recognized as higher than any human law. We thank you for the opportunity that this election year puts before us to exercise our solemn duty not only to vote, but to influence countless others to vote and to vote correctly. Lord, we pray that your people may be awakened. Let them realize that while politics is not their salvation, their response to you requires that they be politically active. Awaken your people to know that they are not called to be a sect fleeing the world, but rather a community of faith renewing the world. Awaken them that the same hands lifted up to you in prayer are the hands that pull the lever in the voting booth, that the same eyes that read your word are the eyes that read the names on the ballot, and that they do not cease to be Christians when they enter the voting booth. Awaken your people to a commitment to justice, to the sanctity of marriage and the family, to the dignity of each individual human life, and to the truth that human rights begin when human lives begin and not one moment later. Lord, we rejoice today that we are citizens of your kingdom. May that make us all the more committed to being faithful citizens on earth. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Electionprayer.com Now let's look at the way this prayer is structured. I wrote this prayer some years ago beginning with an acknowledgement of who is in charge. Because when we think about elections, we think about politics, we think about power. Who leads the nation? Well, the prayer begins by acknowledging who is Lord of all the nations, who leads the universe. From whom does all power derive? If there's such a thing as elections, that means there's such a thing as earthly authority. If there's such a thing as earthly authority, where does it come from? The prayer begins by acknowledging where it comes from. So that's where a prayer for elections does need to start. 
All authority, and Paul says this to us in Romans 13, right? All authority is established by God. St. Peter repeats this as well uh, as he writes in his first epistle. So authority comes from the Lord. It is established here on earth. It's legitimate for us to acknowledge it and to collaborate with it. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, Jesus said, and give to God what is God's. That's what we're doing here as we begin the prayer. We're acknowledging full authority is in God, and yet he shares it with human beings. So he is Lord of individuals, but he is Lord of nations and governments, King of kings and Lord of lords, as the scriptures tell us. This, by the way, is why the prophets in the Old Testament could always admonish the kings, why John the Baptist admonished Herod, got his head chopped off, but was courageous nonetheless in admonishing him about the sanctity of marriage. So it then goes on to thank the Lord for the privilege we have of organizing ourselves politically. That is a privilege. It's a sharing, if you will, in the governance that God exercises over the whole world. There's governance within the family. There's governance within the church. There's governance in the civil arena, the different levels of government, from the local, state, and all the way up to the federal. Then I put point out, political loyalty does not have to mean disloyalty to you. There are some people who think it does. In other words, oh, well, you know, if you're religious, you've got to stay away from politics. Well, who said politics is intrinsically evil? Now, politics is filled with corruption. We know that. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But to organize ourselves politically in and of itself isn't something wrong and doesn't mean that we are automatically being unfaithful to God. It means we may be tempted to be. Some people are going to be tempted to be power grabbers and use it not to serve the rights and needs of others, but to destroy them. That's what's sinful, not the organizing of ourselves politically in and of itself. Then we talk about the law. Our founding fathers acknowledged that there are two sets of laws, human law and divine law, and that the human law always has to conform to the divine law. They said this, they wrote it, they were very explicit about it. And our, our, our Declaration of Independence acknowledges the laws of nature and of nature's God. These are not laws that we write, and these are laws that we cannot contradict. So we begin by laying that out as well. Then we talk about the the opportunity of the election year and voting as a duty, not just as a right, it's a duty. Why? Love of God and love of neighbor. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. We vote out of obedience to God who has given us a share in the governance of the world. He put Adam in charge of the garden, right? He gives human beings responsibilities for the world around them. So we thank you for this opportunity to exercise our solemn duty to vote. Love of God, love of neighbor. Voting actually becomes a form of service to our neighbor because the people we elect are going to make laws that affect our neighbor. So if we see that somebody's running for office and the laws that he or she is committed to writing and implementing are laws that are going to help uh, make it easier for my neighbor, first of all, to be protected, secondly, to start a small business, for example, and grow it for the sake of his family or send his children to the the school of, of, of his choice, not of the government's choice, and on and on it goes through all the different policy Uh, prescriptions that we're going to look at when we decide whom to vote for, well, then that's an act of service to my neighbor if I choose the right person that's going to pass the right laws that are actually going to help my neighbor rather than hurt him. Our duty to vote flows from the duty of the love of God and the love of neighbor. Not only our duty to vote, but to influence countless others to vote. We all have that sphere of influence. And as we go into an election year, we cannot just be thinking about our own vote. We think about the votes of those others that we can influence. And we influence them, first of all, 
by reminding them that they have the duty to vote. Influencing someone's vote starts with initiating it. Are you registered? So we have checkyourvoterregistration.com as a special website we've set up where people anywhere in the country can go and put in their zip code and check to see their, you'll, your voter record will come up. If you put in there where you, uh, not just your zip code, but where you live or on the address under which you're registered, it'll check it against the voter files. When we help other people to do this, we are helping them to fulfill their duty. So this is not simply, uh, should not simply be seen as a political activity. I say this to pastors. If you have a voter registration in your church, which you're perfectly free under the law to do and uh, should do, if you have a voter registration drive, you're not engaging in something political as much as you're engaging in something pastoral. Why pastoral? Because these people in the church, you are telling them what? You are telling them that they need to go into the world and, 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 and witness to the gospel, make a change in the world for the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God is broken into us, into our history. That's the good news. And then the duty that comes with that is to go out and proclaim that kingdom. How are you going to change the world if you're not registering to vote? There's many ways that we change people, that we can influence things. But this is one of the key ones. And if you're not registered, you're not going to be able to vote. If you don't vote, it's a you're missing a really big opportunity to make a change in the world for the better. That's why there's the duty to get others involved in the process that we acknowledge we're supposed to be involved in as well. Having voter registration drives is one of the many ways that we do that. Well, this I've only gone through the first one third of this prayer. I want to continue uh, looking into this prayer with you and explaining it line by line. We'll continue that tomorrow in the program. But again, electionprayer.com. Now, I told you that I have some other prayer resources. If you go to prolifeprayers.com, you'll see that there are several, a series of booklets that I've written prayer booklets. And let me just briefly tell you what these are. In the palm of his hand, prayers to end abortion. And these are prayers for different from different angles, uh, uh, different circumstances, different dimensions of uh, the pro-life uh, cause. And then after that, I wrote this booklet, In the Heart of His Mercy, because abortion wounds people very deeply. It kills a child, of course. But it wounds the mother, the father, the grandparents, a lot of other people. It wounds them deeply and for life. This is a prayer for healing from those wounds, because Christ is the great healer. So in the heart of His mercy is, and you see these are all around the same size. Uh, they're all around 60 uh, pages long. The third one I wrote in this series is called In the Light of His Word, Biblically-Based Prayers to End Abortion. And the biblically-based prayers, what I do is I take a scripture passage and then build from the themes in that passage and the lessons in that passage, build a prayer based on that and apply it to our youngest brothers and sisters in the womb. So In the Light of His Word, and all of these, again, are at pro lifeprayers.com. And finally, the newest one, in the power of his spirit, prayers invoking the Holy Spirit to end abortion. There's many dimensions of our faith in the Holy Spirit, again, as the scriptures lay out for us, the spirit of truth, the advocate, he makes us advocates for others, just as he advocates for us in the heights of heaven, and many other beautiful uh, dimensions of our faith in the Holy Spirit that can guide us in our prayer life. So I encourage you to get hold of these books. And you can, in fact, you can see the prayers themselves on that page as well, uh, prolifeprayers.com. But you can also, also order the books. So prolifeprayers.com, check out those four prayer booklets. Let's turn back to prayer now uh, as we conclude. Father, we do ask you to bless America. We are people of faith. We are people of prayer. Our founding fathers knew to pray for this nation. 
and even in our founding documents, Lord, to entrust themselves to the providence of you who govern the universe and are the judge of all. We thank you, Lord, that these insights were given to these founding fathers and that you guided them in crafting a nation where we can live as one and where we can protect the rights of all. Thank you, Lord. Keep us deep in prayer as we observe the things that are going on in our midst. And Lord, as we read the headlines, as we see the news, as we get upset by things that are going on, may we always use that as a stepping stone, as a stimulus to prayer. Constantly keep us in your love, in your grace, and in your peace. And we sum up all our prayers by using the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, friends. Stay connected on social media. I'm at FR Frank Pavone on all the major social media platforms. Follow me on Truth Social and Getter and all the others at FR Frank Pavone. And then you can also follow Right Side Broadcasting, of course, at RSB Network. Thanks, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. I think we have Richard Lee, we have uh, Jim Garlow, and we have Father Frank Pavone. Someplace there in the audience, so I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Follow him, Father Frank Pavone, 